Hi Year 6, so today I'm going to read the next part of the book above pay grade, The Boy with the Bronze Axe by Kathleen Fidler. It's going to be chapter 6, pages 81 to 86. And if you look just below the video, you'll be able to see the Vipers questions that we're going to be asking today. So if you want to pause the video now and have a little look so that you know what the questions are that are coming up, have a go now. Okay, so chapter six, the day of the whale. The next day, the men of Skara stripped the branches from the tree. They worked with their flint knives hacking away while Tenko's bronze axe flashed in the sun. They took the branches to Lokar's hut where they would be safe until they could be shaped for use. How are we going to make a boat of this big trunk, Tenko? Bruno asked. It is going to take us many a moon to hollow it out with our knives. There is a quicker way than that, Tenko told him. First, it is true that you must hollow out with your knives, but afterwards we use fire. Fire? Berno asked. Yes, when we have hollowed out a shallow groove, then we will bring peats from the fire and set them in the hollow and leave them to burn. But will they not burn away the whole tree? Lemba asked anxiously. No. We must watch it until it has burned deeply enough. We will have bowls of seawater at hand to throw upon the fire and put it out when the hollow is deep enough for men to sit in. They chipped away with their flint knives, working through all the hours of daylight. In three days, Tenko thought the hollow was deep enough. On their bone shovels, they carried smouldering peats and packed them loosely in the hollow carved in the tree and left them to burn away. Day and night, a man in turn watched to make sure that the fire did not go out, nor yet burn too fast. Tenko constantly inspected it. It is ready now, he pronounced at last, when almost the whole centre of the trunk had been burned away, leaving a thick shell of wood all around it. They doused the fire till only a mess of steaming charcoal was left in the hollow. As soon as it is cool enough, you must get to work with your knives again, Tenko said. It was much easier to chip away the burned wood in the hollow. With flint knives and adzes made of stone, the men cleaned and deepened the centre of the craft. So that brings us to our first question. But before we talk about that, if you have a look on the vocabulary at the side of the Vipers questions page, you will see a picture of an adze. It's a little bit like an axe. Our first question today is an explain question. Explain how they made the hollow in the tree to make the boat. So have a think about the things that they've done to make the hole in the middle of the tree so that there is a place for the men to sit. So to make the hollow, first of all, they had to use their flint knives to carve out a small section, a small groove in the trunk of the tree. Then they brought smouldering peats that were just burning and put them inside the groove and that burnt out a hollow in the boat but they had to make sure that it neither burnt too much nor too little. Then they put it out with water and the charcoal that was left which was softer and easier to remove they finished removing with their flint knives until they'd made a hole big enough for men to sit in. It will drive more easily over the waves if you shape the ends to a point, Tenko directed. Once more, the men worked on the boat until Tenko declared it was ready for water. Then they shaped paddles out of some thicker branches. Tenko took the supple thick twigs with which he could easily bend them to make bows. Others he shaped into arrows. At last came the launching of the boat. The men pushed it into the sea and watched anxiously while Tenko tried it out. He made a wide circle around the bay and came back to the anxious group on the beach. It is good, he said with satisfaction. The Skara boat goes well. I should like Berno to be the first to try it. Berno eagerly climbed in and took the paddle. Tenko gave the boat a push into deeper water. At first, Berno wobbled slightly until he learned to adjust his balance. Take care, Berno. Remember, the boat is rounded and can easily turn over in the water, Tenko shouted after him. Soon Berno got the knack of handling it and brought the Skara boat triumphantly round the bay. Lemba did well too. <clears throat> Salik had his turn too, but he did not venture out too far 
and soon the boat was brought back again. Oh, I think I am made for a herdsman and not a fisherman, he said. All the time my stomach was turning over inside of me. Tresco sneered at him. You are soon scared, Salic. I will take my turn with the boat now. Berno looked questioningly at Tenko, but Tenko nodded. He gave Berno a grin. Tresco seated himself in the boat and seized the paddle. Watch me, he cried. <clears throat> so that brings us to our next question. It's a predict question. With all of Tresco's sneering and bravado, what do you think will happen when he takes his turn in the boat? Have a think. What are the options? What could happen when he goes into the boat? As we read on, we'll find out whether your prediction was correct. <clears throat> he moved into the bay at a good speed and seemed to be doing quite well. Tenko, however, stepped into his own boat and said to Bruno, Take the other paddle, Bruno. We will go after Tresco. I doubt if he can really handle the boat. Tenko's boat, with two men in it, moved faster than the Scara boat. They began to make up time on Tresco. Tresco turned his head and saw them rapidly approaching. He decided to show them that he could easily keep ahead of him. That was his undoing. He failed to steer towards the oncoming waves, but turned beam onto them. It seemed as if a playful wave was waiting. It rolled the log boat over and Tresco fell into the water with a shriek. When Tenko and Bruno caught up with him, Tresco was hanging on to the capsized boat. So did you predict that actually he was more likely to capsize and fall out of the boat rather than make a good go at actually steering and paddling the boat? I thought that might happen. Tenko brought his own boat alongside him. Tresco grasped it with the grip of one half drowning. Do not hang on to the side, Tresco. You might overturn us too. Work your way towards the stern of the boat, Tenko told him. Tresco paid no heed. Come on now. Do you want me to bring my paddle down on your hands? Bruno cried. If you upset us, we shall be so busy saving ourselves that we shall have no time for you. Reluctantly, Tresco shifted his grip one hand at a time until he had worked his way to the stern. Pull me into the boat, he cried. No, you must hang on and be pulled through the water, Tenko told him. Bruno, can you manage the boat alone? Why? What are you going to do? Bruno asked in alarm. Swim after the other boat. Already it is drifting away. We're not going to lose it after all our trouble in making it. I must take my paddle in case I cannot recover Tresco's. Steady the boat while I jump. Tenko stood up and leapt lightly into the water. Pushing the paddle before him, he swam after the other craft. Are you not making for the shore? Tresco asked Bruno. It's very cold in this water. Kick your legs if you are cold, Bruno told him in a contemptuous voice. And that's our last question today. It's a vocabulary question. Kick your legs if you are cold, Bruno told him in a contemptuous voice. What does contemptuous mean? So if you have contempt for something, it means that you dislike it, you find it distasteful, perhaps you even resent it a little bit. So Bruno resents Tresco for the way that he's behaved in the past with regards to Tenko. And now, because he's nearly lost the boat that they took so, hard, so long to make and worked so hard to make. And so he's punishing him by making him stay in the water and making him understand that he has displeased them. Kick your legs if you are cold, Bruno told him in a contemptuous voice. I will wait to make sure that Tenko is safe. Tenko reached the Scara boat. He held his paddle between his knees so that he had both hands free. Then, reaching under the craft, he gripped the boat and gave a heave to it. It turned over and began to ride the waves right side up. Tenko took hold of his paddle again and swam after the boat. He flung the paddle aboard and then poured himself into the craft by the stern. He picked up the paddle and turned the Scara boat toward the shore. It's all right, Bruno. Let's go, he called. Bruno started paddling too. Both boats moved towards the shore, with Tresco trailing along like some strange fish behind the bigger craft. 
Willing hands pulled their boats ashore when they reached the shallow water. Tenko leapt out and went to aid Tresco up the beach. Tresco looked half-drowned, frightened and utterly miserable. All his conceit had vanished. It would be a long time before he would venture out in the craft again. Carwin came towards him. Look after him, Carwin. He'll feel sick, Tenko advised him. He turned to Bruno. I could not find the paddle. It had already floated away. Then we must make another, Bruno sounded vexed. We'll make it a rule that if any man loses a paddle, he must carve another. Yes, but the wood will not last forever. The shoulder blades of an ox are not as easy to use, Tenko reminded him. The men of Scara learned to use their new boat, all except Tresco, who had had enough of it. Bruno and Brocken proved especially skilful at handling the boat. Besides making arrows out of the spare wood, Tenko made a long spear out of a straight branch and wedged a sharp flint arrowhead at the top of it. This was useful for fishing for flatfish in the shallow water and for poking crabs out of their holes. The fish made a welcome change to their main diet of beef, mutton and limpets. One day, Bruno was in the smaller Scara boat, while Brocken and Callie were with Tenko in a larger boat. As they pulled across the Bay of Scale, Brocken suddenly pointed with his finger to the water below them. The tide was nearly full. A great shoal of white bait like a silver cloud was moving in a solid mass towards the shore. If you look in the vocabulary section on your Vipers page, then you'll see a picture of a white bait. It's a type of fish. What's happening? Brocken cried. The children rested their paddles and Bruno pulled alongside them. The white bait did not seem to notice the splash of his paddle or the shadow of his boat above them. The great wedge of fish drove on frantically. There is something strange going on in the water, Tenko said. <gasps> Look what is coming after them, Callie cried. It seemed as if the oncoming waves were made of silver. The sea was a seething mass of shining herring. Are they chasing the white bait? Callie asked. The herring moved in a jostling, heaving mass, forced on by some kind of panic. They drove on towards the land. If you have a look in the vocab, you can also see a picture of a herring, another type of fish. And you can see the definition for the word jostling. Some enemy must be chasing them, Tenko cried. They're trying to get away from something that is pursuing them. What is it? He stared out to sea. Beyond the herring shoals, moving lazily into the Bay of Scale, was a low, dark shape, curving slightly against the horizon. Look! Look over there! Tenko pointed. <gasps> what is it? asked Callie, frightened. It is a great fish. Greater than I have ever seen, Bruno said. Tenko's face was alight with excitement. It's a whale, he cried. It chases the herring shoals. A whale? Locker once told us about a whale. Bruno began to get excited too. Long ago, there was one came ashore in Orkney, long before our time, near one of the other tribes. It could not get back into the sea and it died on the beach. The great fish had red flesh like beef. The folk of the island had plenty of meat from it. The fish had great bones too, so big that the folk used them in their building of their houses. If only this whale would come ashore in the Bay of Scale, we could use it. Then we will drive the great fish ashore, Tenko decided. Tenko, it is so big that with one flip of its tail, it could turn our boats over and smash them to pieces, Bruno told him. The whale was swimming in much closer. If we could frighten it into a panic, like the other fish, then it might come right into the bay. The tide is near the turn. It might get left behind on the beach, Tenko said. If we frighten it, it is more likely to turn and make off into the deep water again, Bruno pointed out. Then we must get behind it so that we are in between it and the deep sea, Tenko cried. That might be dangerous, Bruno said. And that's the end of this section for today. We'll read some more in the next session. Bye.